Okay, uh, so the lecture today is about basic concept around neural networks, specifically also looking at optimization. Uh, we'll look at uh, optimization, gradient computation, but also we, we spent some time with the TAs and over the years try to gather some uh, guidelines on how to optimize these deep models. Um, and originally, we called it multimodal optimization, but a lot of these tricks are, are, are true for uh, a large number of, um, of, uh, of applications. So it's not just true for multimodal, but they are definitely very important in multimodal. And so we'll uh, continue to um, so these are some of the, uh, this is the objective for today. Um, multi, just a quick reminder from last week. Um, if you remember, uh, not last week, but last lecture, uh, multi-layer for feed forward networks. This is an example with uh, two layers, two hidden layers. Um, if I ask you um, how many uh, score, uh, how many score functions, uh, or how many scores you have, in this case, is only one score. As you remember, the last layer could have multiple score, um, multiple layer, uh, multiple neurons. And if you remember, each of these uh, is a little bit like a linear classifier. Each neuron is a, almost a linear classifier with this activation function that, that, that renormalize the output of uh, the uh, classification, the linear classification. And so uh, each of these neurons, uh, the, for this neuron, you have three inputs. Uh, and so you have these uh, parameters, these are uh, called model parameters. And so you have model parameter for one neuron, two neuron, three neuron, four neurons, concatenate all of them together, that becomes W1. And then you do the same W2 and W3. And so the model parameters, uh, uh, this is what we want to optimize. Uh, and we will use the last function as a measure to know, hey, uh, am, am I at the right spot? Am I, uh, is, it the, um, is it a good place to be um, for given these uh, W, and you could say at the beginning it's random, these numbers, and then you can compute the loss, uh, and as we'll see, we'll compute the gradient from that, and then make a step, make a step, and we'll, we'll discuss this in more details that'll give you a high level, but take a step means you change those parameters. And when you change those parameters, then you can recompute your loss. And that gives you uh, one, that's one way to see if you're uh, making progress. Uh, we'll go more in details in a second. So the core is learning those model parameters. How do we learn those model parameters? As you remember, we have a training set um, and a training set in this case will be for a supervised task. So you have X, the input, and Y is the uh, output, the, the output labels. And we'll suppose for now that this is a fixed training set, that the, you don't have uh, online learning, for example. And our goal is to learn those weights, the, both weights and biases together. And as we discussed, uh, you define as part of your model design, we define uh, an architecture and also at the same time, we design also uh, our loss function um, or selected a loss function. And if you really don't know which loss function to do, then you could have a bunch of candidates and we discuss about the possibility of doing model selection as a hyperparameters for your model. But we'll, we'll discuss that uh, later. But optimization, and I, 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 I love this analogy. Um, um, uh, it's this, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit like uh, exploring Switzerland, uh, Switzerland, uh, but, but, but with folded, uh, blindfolded, and finding, trying to find the highest peak, uh, highest mountain. Uh, you could go lowest uh, if you, uh, but let's say you maximize in this case. And so you, you want to find the highest peak in, 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 in Switzerland. And so, so you're walking around and, and, and the only thing you will know uh, is, 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 is you have this, uh, this uh, instrument that tells you your uh, altitude, so how high you are. And that's the only thing you do is get that measure. So yeah, at any point in time, you can take a step backward, forward, uh, any kind of direction. As you take a step, um, you get a feeling that you're going down or you get a feeling you're going up. Um, and that's, that, that's, that's this uh, um, idea that, uh, uh, that you can get your loss uh, at time t 
uh, not time t by iteration i, and then your loss at the next iteration and your optimization, and you can see if you're if you're um, getting better or it's improving, and that's that's what the gradient is going to help us with. Um, so we want to minimize the loss function. The loss function tell us, given those weights, given that position I'm in, like I'm at one specific position, what is my altitude? What, what, how good uh, am I? Um, and, and how do we do the optimization? Um, there's different approaches. Um, and, and now these days, uh, it has been a strong focus on gradient-based approaches um, specifically because a lot of the neural networks or neural architectures um, have been designed uh, and have been improved to all have some uh, gradient uh, that uh, most of them have uh, analytical gradient that can be computed and, and for that reason makes gradient, uh, gradient optimization very efficient. We'll discuss more in a second. But, but the other ap uh, approach would be um, to be very exhaustive and try every little place but as you can imagine, if your space is large, like um, space, like let's say Switzerland, um, then that it can be very demanding. So, um, so one other approach, and uh, and so is to just search uh, randomly, uh, and then refine that search, um, and and so um, and so and to refine that search, that's that's the key here is is the gradient is the, and so gradient. I just want to. Most of you hopefully had this uh, in, in either undergrad or some of your grad courses before. Um, but just the gradient is, is, this, uh, is the direction of the greatest rate of increase of the function. And its magnitude is the slope of the graph in that direction. So in a, in a, uh, here you have a, a 2D graph. Um, the, the, the tangent is, is at any point in that graph I can look and say what is the gradient. Uh, in the Switzerland example, it is mostly uh, at any point in this is to know the slope of the mountain. That will be the uh, other way to do it. Formally, this is also a derivative of the function. So it's in fact the derivative of your loss uh, function. Um, and in higher dimension, uh, there's uh, um, different ways of, of optimizing it. Um, uh, so in multiple dimensions, the gradient is the vector of partial derivative. And, and so this is the, and we'll, we'll discuss with an example in a second. Um, so, but in the uh, Switzerland case, um, Switzerland, we only had two variable, like am I uh, going X or Y, like it's a 2D, you could see it as a, to the, the action space being uh, um, going X or Y. And so the gradient will also be two dimensional. It will be a two dimensional vector. Um, um, if you don't have the numerical, uh, the analytical gradient, um, the way to compute a gradient is, is, is just to, to try it. <laughs> what is it? You're, you're in Switzerland, you're, you're in the middle and you have no clue. Um, and you didn't have any kind of map to help you um, or local knowledge about the slope, uh, what can you do? Eh, you, you touch, you, 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 you take a mini step forward, uh, maybe a mini step uh, on the right side, and from that, you, and then see, hey, is it lower or higher? What is my altitude? If I take a step forward, it's a step backward. And so with this, that gives you a nice, uh, that can be one way to get the gradient. But as you expect, this is a very slow process. It's still possible, but it's a, so, a slow process. So, um, and, and can be sensitive on how big of a step you want. You, in, in a perfect world, you want it as, as small as possible. Um, and sometimes you will need even a hyperparameter. But in most cases for you moving forward, uh, and when you look at neural architectures, a lot of it is, is because we, they were designed, or at least uh, one of the great advantage is that a lot of these functions, that activation function and neural activation function, were designed to be differentiable. Um, and so what it means is that the, the, the loss or the local derivatives can be, uh, can be computed uh, and that's one of the main advantage. So, uh, um, and, and, and 
you will love to have it as an exercise and you've probably done that uh, in, in some of your classes. So we don't have to do it. And, and if you ask what, what are those uh, libraries like PyTorch and, and all of this are doing underneath is a lot of this computation for you. Um, and so uh, which one should you use, uh, numerical, analytical? The answer is, is relatively simple in our case because we do have analytical um, so in the case of neural networks, um, just want to go a little bit uh, on like, how is that gradient computation? Okay, and so this is a very simple uh, neural network. You have your input, you have one neurons, and then you have your scoring function, uh, which could be just a normalization of the neuron. And so what's in, what the, the gradient is just the derivative. Um, and so in this case, is a derivative with respect to your input. That's, that's, that's what you want to know. Um, so uh, just a chain rule can be used. If you have many neurons, uh, then it's a multipath chain rule. So, it's a, so at the end, you end up one for each of the path that you have. So when you have many neurons, uh, and then it's just become a sum over this. Um, and then when you have also multiple uh, of these um, uh, of the input, this becomes really important here because at the end of the day, uh, if, if I had only one input, I, I had my gradient is, is one dimensional and it's in fact only the, the size, uh, it, 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 it was like only one value, the gradient. But if I have many of these X's in the case of the, um, of the Switzerland example, I had two of them. I had X and Y. Uh, I, I could go uh, in that space, that 2D space of parameters is like, um, so, um, but, uh, so my gradient will have at least two, uh, uh, two uh, the dimension on this. Uh, in this example, we have three of them uh, in there. Okay, so at the end of the day, the gradient is a vector, is a vector. So there's one value that tells me that loss function, that, 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 that scores, those scores, um, uh, that loss function, if I, if I uh, was to make a little uh, change uh, in the direction of x1, um, will it go up or down? Um, and how much up or down um, will it be? Um, and so that's the gradient. Um, and, and the trick here is that there is uh, what's, what makes it efficient, and we'll talk about it in a second, what makes this uh, gradient computation very efficient is that this gradient computation can be done uh, recursively. Uh, and that's the beauty of it, is that you have a local gradient or kind of a local Jacobian um, that tells you um, how much variation between, uh, from how much uh, variation between uh, H and X, H given X, like what's the derivative of H given X. And then uh, you can uh, backprop, in fact, from the previous, whatever parent you had from uh, there. Here is very simple. This gives you all of the gradient, but let's look at a more uh, realistic example. Also, although very simple, it's, it's a more realistic example. In this example, it's, it's, it's the same one I've shown earlier, uh, which is had like two layers of neural networks, uh, two hidden layers, and then eventually you get your, uh, your scores, and then you can uh, compare these scores uh, with the ground truth labels, and that gives you your loss. So it's, 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 it's rare you see a neural network in that sense, but in that, num that way of writing it, but I strongly like this. I like this because it, 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 everything is there. Um, my, uh, my parameters, whatever parameters I'm looking for are there. Um, these are my model parameters. Um, I have my score function and I have my loss and then I have my ground truth compared with the scores. And here is just a cross entropy I, I picked for this example. So the back propagation go into step. Once there's a feed forward pass where you follow the graph. So mostly you have an input here. Um, if you remember, it, this is an iterative process. So a W has to be uh, initialized to something. And, and often you just initialize uh, to, to random, or you may have a, a warm start 
where you use another, maybe a clustering or something to help you kickstart things. But usually you could even start with randomly these numbers. So what it means is mostly you got dropped somewhere in Switzerland. Poof. And that, that's what it means. You, 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 you got dropped somewhere in Switzerland. Um, and now we need to optimize from there. Um, and so the, the only thing you will do a change is uh, these parameters to move you in, in the space. So you feed forward, what it means is that you, you take your uh, training example, your training examples have X and Y, and you do it for all training example, you run it, uh, you run for each training example with X and Y, run it through the network, uh, that also will give you a loss. And what I didn't put here, uh, because uh, just simplifying, is that it is a summation over all the training uh, that is done. And so when I'm doing this, is I'm doing it as if there was only one X and one Y, but in reality, there's a training. And so you feed forward all of your training um, data, uh, and then that will allow you to compute uh, these uh, intermediate uh, forward paths and then you will go and start from the top and you initialize your gradient as one. And then you do, uh, you compute that local gradient, uh, local Jacobian uh, here, which is between, in this case, will be between L and Z. Um, and then you use the chain rule. So originally my gradient was one. I, I go ahead and I multiply by local uh, Jacobian. And then I go on and on and on and on until I get to the final part here. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the vector I will get will be the same dimension as X, as you remember, because that's really what I'm looking for, is like uh, I have X and Y in the case of Switzerland. Oh, sorry, I use X and Y, uh, it's, uh, it's confusing. Sorry, I meant uh, you have X1 and X2 uh, here, where the two direction I could go in my Switzerland space, um, but I, I, and I need to compute this efficiently with this. Okay, so this is back propagation. Um, uh, if you want to know more, let us know. We can give you plenty uh, of, of pointers on that uh, for this. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize is that the beauty of these neural architectures is that although it's very complex, like these, like these neurons could be very simple, like a linear activation function, or themselves could be a very complex still. You could have a, a, a full transformer, or like for people who know about transformers or self-attention module or CNN, these could be a full, uh, very complex uh, uh, unit. But as long as you already have analytically the, uh, the gradient, the analytical gradient between the input and output of this module, this is all that I need. As long as I can compute that local Jacobian, like what is locally this uh, derivative, um, this is all that I need to be very efficient. I may not even need to go inside it. Um, in most cases, and the example I will have in class, I will have these units relatively simple. There will be neurons and you could go and write it by hand. Um, what's really nice with these uh, libraries like PyTorch and, and others is that they, they, they create those computational units for you and they already have internally like the knowledge of the gradients and then, and then you just create a bunch of layers. Uh, but what is happening, what is the hardest for uh, a lot of this is how do you compute the gradients efficiently? Um, and so I talk about a sigmoid, that's a simple one, but even a sigmoid unit really have inside it many different steps, like it, 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 there's a divide, there's adding, exponent. So this, all of this is, is uh, but the nice thing is as long as these components are differentiable, then, then uh, the, 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 the full architecture with all of these differentiable are, will also be differentiable. Um, and so that's the beauty of neural networks. So this was a summary uh, and, and a quick view of that. Um, I, gradient descent uh, is, is, is the idea that now uh, I, I know how to compute my gradient analytically with neural networks. So at any point in time when I'm in Switzerland, I will be able to know where's the slope, where's the slope of it. 
And so I have that key thing, gradient now. That's a big important. I have two tools in my, for me. One is my loss function. At any point in time in Switzerland, I can look at the altitude. That's my loss function. The other tool I have is the gradient. At any point in time, I can go and look uh, and find the slope uh, of the mountains. These are the two tools I'm, I will be using during my optimization. And the simplest one is in fact gradient descent. What it is, is at any point in time, I look at uh, the slope and make a decision uh, to go where the slope is, the, uh, is going. Like, so is, if the slope is going down uh, more toward X2 or more toward X1, I will take a step, a step meaning I take an incremental step. And that's in fact a hyperparameter of, uh, of the optimization of how big a step I should take. But let's say for now, I could take a, a step of one, uh, one being one time the gradient, um, just for simplicity for now. We'll talk about how big of a step we should take. That's a big important aspect of that. Um, but there are, in fact, courses on optimization. And, and these are very interesting. I, I, I highly suggest to take the time to take a full class on optimization. Um, I will just give you a, a hint about uh, these uh, different approaches. Um, is that um, instead of taking the gradient, um, you could take the derivative of the derivative. So gradient is a derivative of the loss. And then you could take a derivative of that. Most likely you will do a numerical derivative in this case, uh, but may, you may be lucky and, and, and you can easily de uh, uh, have the analytical um, gradient uh, of, of the second one. Uh, but the, the, the Hessian, which is that second derivative, is very interesting. It's kind of the acceleration of the velocity uh, in this case. And that can give you or guide you of how big of a step you should take. And so there's a, a many different one, a BFGS, uh, which is, uh, if you wonder why it's called BFGS, it is the last name of, I think, all the authors. Uh, um, so, um, and, and LBFGS, just an extension of that. Um, so instead of always taking a first step, then you could go and, and kind of approximate the Hessian and then that will hopefully give you better, uh, appro um, better knowledge. Now, because they're, in a sense, you may end up taking less steps by doing uh, something like quasi-Newton or Newton approach, but they're computationally more demanding. And so there's a trade-off and so neural network often will just go and directly go with gradient descent in this case. Um, so um, the parameters used, and so in reality, um, you, you would like to decide like how, how big my parameters, I, I, here I use theta, um, you, uh, it's just a notation change. I, I personally prefer theta over W, but this, is, this could be W, so WT and WT plus one. I use T here, um, sometimes also I prefer just to use I because T is not because time like a sequence of time, but it's time in a sense of uh, optimization time, like uh, optimization iterations. Um, and so the, the basic gradient descent just say, hey, um, this is my W at time T. I want to compute my new W. And what I will do is, is use my gradient and just take a step uh, in that direction. And how big of a step is, is what we will often call learning rate. Um, and so the learning rate will be very important. Is like how big of a step should I take? You could get the, uh, like a constant one, always the same. In practice, uh, uh, you will vary this. Uh, and so you will have a learning rate and, and a, uh, maybe a decay uh, of this. So you have an initial learning rate. Uh, and then you can have also kind of a decay learning rate, which is linear until iteration. Uh, so this is a, a, there's a lot of these tricks you can go of like, um, so you could just decade this uh, and, and with an increase. Um, and so these are some of the approaches. In practice now these days, uh, I will say maybe, I don't know how many years, maybe five years ago, a lot of this was still using these. Now these days we have some that are uh, working with uh, extension, which uh, will do uh, approximation, more, more accurate approximation of this. Uh, I just listed some of them uh, here. 
um, and, and there are new ones almost every year uh, also coming up. Um, so um, so I, I, I don't want to go in details on this uh, vanilla gradient descent. What I want to say is that also one of the challenge, and this is something more of a design thing, is that you have a data set. And if you remember, when I said you compute your gradient, one of the first steps, you have X and Y. And then I said, hey, for your whole data set, you, you want to be able to take for the whole data set, um, run uh, feed forward, and then uh, compute your gradient with that uh, information. Um, and, and so um, this, is, uh, this will be true. Uh, and back in the days when the data sets were small, it was not of an issue. Um, and, then, uh, and then you have a spectrum. So one is you use the, all of your data every time. Um, and sometimes it's needed, like a lot of the Newton approaches requires almost uh, sometimes to, to have all of your data to, to work well. Um, but but on the extreme case is to pick only one sample. It's called a uh, stochastic gradient, where you will just pick one uh, one sample, compute the gradient, take a step, and, and go uh, pick another random sample, make a step, compute the gradient, make a step, and optimization. As you can expect, there's somewhere in the middle, and and so batch processing will be. Uh, and the hope there is that you have enough information there that's representative uh, of your whole data set, but is also computationally more efficient. So, okay. And we will call this an epoch or an iteration when you manage to go through all of your data. So um, uh, a batch approach will usually, um, what it will end up doing is that you will in fact go through all of your batches. Uh, so if you take all your data and slice a uh, bin and put it in bins or in batches, then an epoch is over all of this. So um, I want to emphasize a little concept where you hear sometimes me saying uh, this is convex versus non-convex. Uh, convex would be wonderful uh, if life was, uh, not life was convex, but uh, maybe if life was convex too, but if, if, um, if your function your, was convex, uh, it would be great. Uh, what it means is that it means that it, wherever you start, um, you will always find that local minima, or if it's maximization, local maxima. Um, but in, in most cases, Switzerland included, uh, Switzerland is a non-convex, uh, I don't know if you can say a non-convex country, uh, but, yeah, um, but it's, it's definitely a non-convex um, uh, case because there are lo lo local minima, or in the case of Switzerland, a lot of local maxima. Um, so that is in itself a big challenge and there's a lot of uh, very in uh, interesting work that has been done. Uh, there, some of it is very well theoretically grounded. Some of it is also just guidelines that you learn uh, uh, through uh, trial and through uh, sharing experience with uh, colleagues. And so, uh, but when you have those local minima, um, you have different version of that uh, but one of the big challenge when you have a local minima, you have uh, a few of these, but one of them will be, for example, is, uh, is to uh, just clearly just getting stuck there, like thinking that the local minima is the global minima. Um, another version of it is that if, if your steps is too large, if you took too big of a step, uh, then you will end up oscillating back and forth in that uh, local minima, um, and and then uh, and if you have flat, then then they are very close to flat or flat. Then the the gradient it will be very hard to get out of this because you suddenly uh, the steps will will just be the gradient will be a lot less informative there, and then this is why you can think of of being adaptive in your because it will help you to go out of this. Um, and so there's different, there's, 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 you can do it empirically to show the difference of a good learning rate with a bad learning rate. Um, when you do train a model, always plot your loss over iterations. It's, it's, it's like, this is 101 uh, to do that. Another trick that I, I forgot if I'd put it in the slides later, uh, but um, always look uh, at, at your training loss uh, how much uh, uh, and and the, the the general rule of thumb is that 
you want to be sure that your model is able to overfit to 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 train to work uh, on your training data, um, and then you could look at your validation set and see if it generalizes. Um, I, I think I have some slides about it later, but but the general rule of thumb is uh, always look at the loss, uh, training loss. Uh, you want your training loss to go down. Um, if it does not, uh, then there's two things. I mean, one is the model may not be uh, either enough uh, flexible or, or, or there's maybe a need for a better initialization or in this case will be a better learning rate. Um, so these are important to do. Uh, in reality, learning rates never look like the, the left. It, it, it looks a lot more like this. And, and don't worry that that's, that's a more typical learning rate. But you, you want, uh, no, 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 sorry, I say typical learning rate. This is a loss. Uh, this is a typical uh, loss uh, for, uh, depiction. So, um, and, and so here the, the X axis would be iteration and so here it will be the loss. Okay, practical guidelines. Let me give you a few of these. Um, I don't, um, I, I will go relatively quickly over that. Um, I, we put a lot of information in this, um, but I, 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 I um, uh, um, and, and, and so let me go through them. Uh, if you have questions, we're really happy to answer that. Because we have this special event, uh, team matching event, then we're, we'll shorten a little bit this uh, practical guideline. And next week, we're, we're starting uh, with the good stuff. Uh, we're gonna do visual representation, uh, language representations. Uh, we'll also start uh, the week after that with the multimodal representation. So all the good stuff is coming uh, in the coming week. Uh, but these are important. I mean, if you, most of you probably took a class maybe in machine, all of you probably uh, were, took a class in machine learning, but some of you also probably took it in deep learning. So you may know some of these tricks. Um, the, I talked about it already about adaptive learning rate, and I, I gave examples of that. This is just an animation that showed uh, the advantages of, of these, because sometimes you, you will um, overshoot or undershoot these kind of situation, and so it, it can be uh, very challenging here. You can see if you overshoot, you can clearly get out uh, of this. Uh, I also told you about uh, the challenge of local uh, minimum, um, or local maximum. Um, I want to discuss the saddle point. Um, the saddle point is very challenging, um, deep learning, because uh, uh, there's many of these uh, minima, um, and many, not all of them, are actually almost as good as the global due to parameter permutation. Um, so lots, uh, lots and lots of saddles in, in many deep learning models. And so saddle is, 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 is like, uh, is, is like uh, this place where it's not just a valley, it's, it also goes down. And so if in this case you were trying to go up, um, you, could, um, you could easily get and, and fall almost out of the cliff. Um, so just uh, some uh, approaches uh, to detect the saddles. Uh, you can calculate the Hessian. Uh, we talk about it uh, when we talk about the Newton approaches. Um, and so this is uh, one way to uh, look at this and be able to help with uh, these uh, saddle points. I'm not giving as much in this uh, kind of on purpose because now these days there are a lot of these that uh, have been, in, a lot of these tricks have been included in uh, these uh, different libraries. Um, so uh, you can handle a lot of them from that. Um, one uh, also uh, to be real and uh, to be aware is that um, uh, the, if you look, uh, it's not always the fault of the learning rate or the momentum. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's sometimes it's also just the data or the model, the data itself. And so uh, it's always good um, to go ahead and you want to be sure as a first step you want to be sure that you are able to overfit uh, on the training data. I mean, this is step number one. You want to be sure that you overfit on your data. Um, so if you, if you at least manage to overfit to the data, uh, that, is, that means that the, the data, the model has enough flexibility um, to, to, to get there. 
Now you may need after that to do some what will uh, uh, regularization, which we'll talk in a second, to go from something that's like maybe over complex to something that's uh, a little bit more simpler. Um, but the first step first is like, let's go ahead and, and just be sure you can fit uh, to this, even if you're kind of having a lot more complexity to your model than needed. Uh, at least you know there's a, a, a path to success. If you don't have this, then 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 revisit a lot the the momentum and uh, and the different learning parameters. Um, there's the problem of bias and variance. Simple models are unlikely to find a solution to a hard problem, and thus probability of finding the right model is low. Um, uh so so that's one of the issue and like the linear classifier will be an extreme version um and complex model on the other side i uh, find many solutions to the problem uh but they may not generalize as well and so that's one of the problem uh and neural networks are there and so that's why uh, the key second aspect to that is regularization uh, regularization, we discussed very quickly last lecture. Let me give you a little bit more intuition. Uh, it's easier to, to think about it, at least for me, visually. Um, so, uh, so regularization is the idea, uh, and, 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 and the, like simple regularization, like L2 regularization. What, 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 what will help you is that, um, although um, you may not see every example, um, you, you, may, uh, you may want to be able to generalize to new cases. And uh, L2 generalization is, is nice in that sense, is that it will help that um, even if you don't see some uh, example that you will hopefully be able to uh, generalize better. The L1 is nice because it um, allow you to, or force you to be, uh, to be zero uh, for some of the parameters, and that brings us some sparsity. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, regularization with this. Um, so the, the most typical L1 regularization, if you were to take this linear classifier and put L1 regularization, this is mostly lasso. Um, and if you do L2, uh, this is mostly what's also called ridge. And if you put the two together, it's called elastic net. Uh, you may have heard that um, elastic net is a really good contender. I, I told you earlier, um, do k nearest neighbor. I will say one other uh, one that's really good is just a simple elastic net on your problem, just to see like like very simple model. What does it pick up? Does it pick up anything? You'd be surprised the number of times that if you have very good features, very good input features a linear or very simple model could be really good as well. So it's always healthy to have those like nearest neighbor and simple like elastic neck to go uh, with this. So um, structural regularization, uh, lots of model can learn everything uh, and go for the simple one. Uh, and, and so uh, that's a general rule of thumb. Um, and so the way of regularizing, there's different ways of regularizing. The, the one that people always uh, think about uh, will be about um, adding kind of an, a term like, uh, like I said, L1 or L2, or dropout, uh, which is also another type of regularization, um, which we'll talk in a second ab about. Um, but the other way of kind of model-based kind of, you could say, uh, uh, regularizing is just to go with simple model first and slowly go build more and more complex. Um, so one, you go complex and then put regularization. The other, you go simple model and slowly building that. So um, that will be another approach. And I strongly suggest that as well. So I, I want to talk about co-adaptation. And that also gives you uh, an intuition about uh, dropout, why uh, this uh, dropout regularization is, is also quite uh, important. Um, and so uh, there is this issue in many neural networks, uh, multi-layer perception uh, will often have, if, you, if, you, if you're not careful, um, is that there's a few things that can happen. A neuron learns something that is not useful. It, and and that, that, is, uh, that can happen. I mean, if you start randomly, uh, um, randomly initializing thing, uh, it's possible that, um, neurons can learn something that is uh, not useful. 
Um, the, the issue with that, if it was just like, hey, some neurons don't, um, then uh, the other neuron will learn to fight this useless neuron. So, uh, and so you may end up uh, uh, with one neuron and the, the other neuron to kind of compensate that, 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 that wrong or neuron. And, and then only maybe some a subset of that that end up using really the, the, the right uh, learning, the, the, the right thing. And so uh, there's different approaches, but one that's been very nicely uh, and uh, is to just uh, drop, uh, simply multiply the output of a hidden layer uh, with a mask of zero, which is kind of equivalent to dropping um, some uh, of these neurons. Um, and this is during training, you will do that. Um, and so during training, uh, you will uh, randomly, uh, and, uh, um, and there's a hyperparameter here, which is um, how many of these you will drop. And you could see it as just multiplying with uh, Bernoulli distribution. Um, so the dropout, the forward step is you multiply with the Bernoulli distribution. Uh, that's if you remember in um, the back propagation, the first step is forward. And so you will randomly. Um, and, and then the backwards just calculate the gradient the same as before. Uh, and so the, the forward is which ones works better, uh, the backwards, some neurons are out of the network, so how does this work? All good? No. Uh, so uh, you need to also do a small adjustment. I mean, this is more of a, a little um, kind of implementation uh, details just to know, but then in the back progression, you need to change a little bit uh, the, the reweighting of that because you suddenly uh, don't have all of the neurons that were activated. So, um, so uh, drop out, stop co-adaptation, and learn kind of an ensemble. Uh, you could see it as learning kind of an ensemble because some of it, uh, and, and so it will force neurons that were like useless to not be useless because maybe this neuron originally was the really good one that was doing all the job, but it got turned off. So now the other neurons to, uh, need to also be working as well. Um, and there's some extension of that. Uh, and so uh, you say Gaussian dropout, instead of multiplying by Bernoulli, uh, you multiply by a Gaussian with mean one. Uh, you can also allow skip connection to happen. Um, I invite you to look at these uh, for that. So, so the last part uh, I want to bring is maybe a little bit more specific to multimodal optimization. Although as you can expect, these uh, also come in some other optimization problem. But in multimodal, um, some of the biggest challenge is the data is from different sources. Um, and so in many cases, uh, let's say the simplest one uh, that we will uh, give uh, an example earlier was uh, uh, in the previous lectures was uh, for uh, images and captions. And, and if you remember, we had the red car or blue car and so, and so you have the image of a blue car and you have the caption of a blue car. And so uh, when, you, when you're learning to process these uh, and when you model these, you often, let's say for the language, you may have a recurrent neural network or these days you may use more of a, uh, a transformer or self-attention model. But let's say for simplicity, let's use a, a recurrent neural network. And for the image, you may have a CNN, or both of these we'll talk about more next week. But in itself, both are, are what we call computation units, uh, because that's a big computation unit, a CNN and a big computation LSTM. Um, so, um, and they have, each of them can have uh, different ways um, to uh, be uh, trained, uh, and not be different ways to, they're all trained to gradient, but um, they, um, the gradient, uh, if you do it from scratch, um, there is some issues that could come out. Uh, for example, uh, maybe one of them, one of the two tasks is a lot harder to train than the other, and maybe most of the gradient goes that way, uh, making it harder for the other to train. Uh, there's a lot of these issues that will happen in a multimodal. Uh, and so, uh, CNNs, uh, some of the example where you have these, I talk already, 
CNN work well with high decay learning rate. This is just an, uh, something, uh, some of the rule of thumb that, that, that we want to share with you. What, what we mean also with this is that there may be not the same learning rate for each of these modules you, you may want to, and I'm about to talk about pre-training as a place to go. So one of the key aspects in, in, in multimodal that you will hear, and now you hear it a lot more. Uh, Pre-training has been very popular in computer vision since 2011, uh, but in natural language processing for the last three-ish years, a little bit more, maybe bit more or less, uh, uh, Pre-training also became very popular in NLP, uh, to the point now you probably hear in the U news about GPT, uh, pre-training uh, of GPT uh, from OpenAI and others. Um, the idea is that the, um, these uh, different modules uh, can be hard to train all together. Uh, and so the idea is to pre-train that. So let's say my task is sentiment. My sentiment meaning you're listening, you're watching me, you're watching me and you're looking at, you're also looking at my uh, words and so you have language and um uh and images and and so you want to train a detector for sentiment so it's going to be a cnn lstm and maybe a sim simple mlp and then that's what you want to train the idea of pre-training is the idea of uh there's two type of pre-training here what i showed here is, is uh, uh, pre-training with a supervised task. So you will use another task, uh, maybe just also sentiment, but just on, on images, which could be just emotion recognition, like positive versus negative emotion recognition. And on language, you could imagine uh, pre-training with a task, also maybe sentiment analysis. There's also other type of uh, pre-training, which we'll discuss uh, more, which uh, you try to do um, either you could call them unsupervised or self-supervised, where you don't have the label, but find a way um, to uh, train the CNN, even if you don't have label. In the case of image, it could be because uh, it, it's big, uh, like the jigsaw puzzle that's called, uh, is like you take all your image uh, and, uh, and uh, I maybe hide uh, part of the image and try to generate it, the rest of that image, uh, or you, you reshuffle the image uh, parts and try to have the CNN uh, solve uh, which part is where. Um, this is an example. We'll discuss more later. Um, in language, uh, what's very popular with self-attention, where you hide uh, a part of the sentence, that's one of the type. Uh, and try to have the rest of the sentence also uh, be able to predict that missing information. This is kind of an extension of what I talked about already when we talk about word to vec of distributional hypothesis, uh, which says the context of a word is, is very predictive of the meaning of the word. So anyway, what I want to say here is that there's a, a, a lot of interest in pre-training. So, the, 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 the weight uh, model parameter of the CNN will be first learned uh, here on the, um, on the, for the CNN first, uh, and then also separately on the LSTM. And eventually uh, uh, you will put them together. Uh, and then uh, you can go two ways at that point. Uh, you could say, hey, I pre-trained CNN, I pre-trained my LSTM, then I will, I will not change anymore the CNN and LSTM, and I'm only gonna, I will only learn MLP. Or uh, you could say, I will at, at the time of this uh, full training to go ahead and do uh, ML uh, fine tuning of the parameters as well. And that is very important in multimodal uh, and, uh, and other places.